people have come to the logical conclusion I could probably pick stuff up with this. <laughs> Hello and welcome to today's episode of Hooper's Beta. You may notice that I am in fact not Jason Hooper. A little bit of a mix up today. Uh, he's going to be off climbing and I'm going to be here teaching you guys about training. By the way, this video is sponsored by Squarespace, the absolute best place to build a website or web store. All right, so today we're here to talk about no hangs or block pulls or edge lifts or farmer's crimps. Turns out that these, uh, while being used for a long time for rehab and more recently more as a primary form of finger training, don't really seem to have a consistent name or a particularly consistent usage. So a little bit today, that's what we're hoping to elucidate. And as much as this seems novel, it's really just sort of a branching of the finger training that you would typically do with climbing or fingerboarding. And yet the way you program it is a bit different. And so hopefully today we're gonna look at why you would choose to use this over a fingerboard or some other tool, when you should think about programming it, and some sort of initial steps for testing and progressions. What would be my background here? I'm pretty good at grabbing little things. I've had the fortune to be able to play with methods like this for quite a while, um, as most of the climbing that I do is on the very fingery granite of Southern California. And most of the stuff that I'm drawn to is stuff with <laughs> inspiringly poor holds. <laughs> Part of why we're looking at this is Lattice recently released an interview with Yves Gravel, which is very much worth checking out. They talked a little bit more about some of the sort of technical nuts and bolts about how you might want to grab it, what sort of devices you might want to use, and some sort of applications that were a little bit more like how you would do this for grip sport in order to pick up as much weight as possible, which is how those competitions work. Um, and we're gonna try to look a little bit more into how specifically would you maybe wanna work this into a normal climbing routine. People have been using this type of suspension training for a while. Typically, it's been a mainstay of pinch training. Even though pinch strength comes up a lot on uh, gym climbs in particular, as well as competition boulders, um, they're an important piece of outdoor climbing as well. Lots of benefits, but um, for whatever reason, the kind of like shift from pinch block to these sort of uh, uh, like no hang type lifts was not as rapid as one might expect. I think a big part of that is climbers tend to have fingerboards available. We have our own body weight. We sometimes have some small additional weight. But until recently, there hasn't been an abundance of no hang type devices or sort of like portable fingerboards. And climbers don't normally have a whole heap of weight. So it's only been as there's been more regular access to modern gyms with full weight setups, as well as suspension type devices that this sort of training has become more popular. So now you're thinking, sweet, I have access to this thing. Why should I do that as opposed to anything else? <laughs> um, and it's a fair question. Hand strength for climbers is really paramount for most types of climbing. And so most climbers who are serious about improvement should have some type of grip training uh, incorporated in their routine. In some sense, it sort of doesn't matter at first what type you use, as long as it's uh, accessible, comfortable, uh, non-injurious, and relatively hard. But when you step back to kind of think about what your options could be, you really just need something that you can pull on. If you've watched our sort of previous videos, you'll probably realize that there are more or less three ways you can pull on something. <laughs> you can do something like a deadlift, you can do something like a row, you can do something like a pull-up. That's more or less it. From kind of practical experience, obviously the pull-up form works. These are basically just fingerboarding, campusing, boulders, things like that. Um, and equally from sort of practitioner experience, it seems that rows sort of don't work. Um, you certainly can do row type finger training. It can be a nice warm up when you're doing things like uh, inverted ring rows. You can clip it onto like a cable machine and do some rows like this. They all work, but they're very kind of challenging or unnecessarily challenging to find the right weight and the, the right form so that the, the kind of like muscles of the forearm and wrist are what is most taxed. A lot of times you'll find kind of maintaining the stance and pulling is sort of too hard. It doesn't really like line up nicely. So assuming that your options are essentially picking things up or picking yourself up, why would you do one versus the other? I have found that Fingerboarding seems to have the best specificity for climbing. It's exactly the kind of positions that you're gonna be getting in. It's gonna provide a lot of sort of shoulder girdle strength, a lot of uh, uh, sort of isometric lock off strength, and it just simulates climbing very nicely and practically. The downside of this though, is that under some circumstances, you're going to be limited by essentially your pull strength, uh, shoulder strength, elbow pain, like some number of things other than just the grip strength. Um, and while that is sort of typically good, 
There's some circumstances where maybe you have a little elbow tendonitis going on, maybe a little bit of a shoulder issue, or maybe you're just focusing a lot of your climbing on big, powerful physical boulders. You're doing a lot of like pull-up training, and it just gets to be a bit much when you add in sort of near maximal isometrics for fingerboarding as well. So in my mind, that's typically the biggest win of doing these, uh, these no hangs as opposed to fingerboarding, which is that you can somewhat decouple your sort of arm and pulling training from your finger strength. It lets you really focus on how the grip feels, how you're engaging through your hands, and basically just grabbing onto something as hard as you possibly can. The other times when this is useful is when you are simply bored of fingerboarding, cannot be bothered to do any more of it, and you want some variety, works very well. They feed into each other nicely. Secondarily, you'll find under some circumstances that there's maybe a grip size, like a 20 mil, which is just a little too big on the fingerboard, and the tens are a little bit too small, and you want just some exposure to a different grip type in a way that lets you kind of control the weight spectrum a little bit more nicely. Um, sometimes people will do their sort of like heavy pulling on a big edge on a fingerboard, but they want to also become more comfortable on smaller edges for, uh, for some of their outdoor projects. Um, in those cases, it can be really useful to do a little bit of fingerboarding and supplement some kind of grip lifts on an edge that's maybe too bad for you to hang or to hang with a lot of weight comfortably. The sort of final reason that I tend to program these is uh, when you start getting into bad weather, whether it's very humid or very hot, you'll find that you end up sliding and damaging your skin a lot more on a fingerboard than seems maybe worth it sometimes. And so with especially the repetition type lifts here, where you're kind of like picking the weight up and putting it back down. You can actually sort of reset your hands in between each rep. And that'll get you around a lot of the sliding and skin damage. The last thing that you might actually want to think about is some people are particularly bad at a certain type of grip. For example, I've always been pretty good at sort of an open or chisel position. I've been pretty good at a crimp position, but I personally have a pretty hard time with a true half crimp. Equally, I know people who are very good at a half crimp, but they suck at full crimp, or maybe they're bad at open three drag. So this just gives you a way to, with a fairly light weight, kind of get exposure to positions that you wouldn't have access to at full body weight. And it really makes it a lot easier to like, just really focus on and pay attention to like how it feels to get into these various grip positions. So Dan's maybe not the best half crimper. I know I'm not that good at three finger drag and Jason's not the best full crimper, but one thing we're all not bad at is building this entire website by ourselves with no coding experience and doing it in probably less than a day. So in case you're not aware, Squarespace makes all of this stuff so easy, including having a blog. I mean, we have a million posts on here and it's so easy to keep track of all this stuff. Another really great feature that we love are the analytics. You can see where your traffic is, where it's coming from, all kinds of information about geography, and it just makes it extremely easy to optimize your website if that's what you wanna do. Last but not least, one of the best features about Squarespace is just all the tools that it has. So here, we have, have to blur some of this out, obviously, because it's confidential information, but here's a scheduling tool that makes it so easy for people to just make consultations like we do on the website, or you can do any kind of appointment you want. It just logs it all in a nice calendar format, keeps track of everything for you, gives you reminders, whatever you want it to do. So make sure you go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com dot com slash hoopers beta to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So your choice of tools here can be a little daunting. <laughs> All manner of possible choices, depending on what you want to train from uh, climbing holds sniped off of system walls, janky homebrew to simulate specific holds or whatever portable warm up board that you have. You can just strap that onto the weights. It'll work absolutely fine. Typically though, um, my preference is to go with the tension block. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other similar things made by um, Lattice and Tindec and Frictitious and you know, kind of all sorts of companies make hold uh, uh, boards sort of like this at this point. But I find the tension block to be particularly comfortable and it has a nice variety of grips for the type of training that I like to do. In addition to some kind of suspension device like this, you're gonna probably need a loading pin. Um, it is possible, uh, to kind of just use like a sling to either tie onto weights or to grab a kettlebell or something like that. But if you're serious about this type of training, you can get one of these for like teens to a few tens of dollars and it's very much worth the investment, I think. It's just gonna make the, uh, the lift a lot nicer and the loading and progression a lot smoother. 
And last thing to think about is that whichever device you choose, you really need to make sure that the holds are comfortable. Um, some companies make things that are really fairly sharp, and so something with a good rounded radius is really important so you don't unnecessarily damage your skin and compromise your climbing sessions. So some people are gonna wonder immediately whether they should train edges or pockets or crimps or blocks or what grip should I use? What should I be training? What am I trying to do here? And really, you know, as much as I hate to say it, that depends on what your projects are and what you're trying to do. Um, I think for most people, you're gonna see the most benefit out, out of choosing one four finger edge in whatever grip you like best and just kind of raging on that. However, once you've kind of uh, gotten used to that, it's sometimes worth incorporating a second grip, which should be something that you're either weak at or is particularly appropriate to uh, your project or the area that you're climbing in. Here in Southern California, a full crimp is a really pretty good idea. Um, if you're gonna be doing some sport climbing on limestone or sandstone or something like that, some pocket prep or monos is probably good or even like just a simple three finger drag. Um, for people without real specific projects or if you're in an area where most of what you're doing is gonna be training in the gym, a pinch block is a really good follow up as a secondary grip. It of course will carry over really well to pinch type climbs, but by having to control and lift uh, a nice block pinch like this, not only do you get a lot of wrist stabilization, you get some uh, wrist flexion into the hold, which is gonna help out with slopers. Um, and you do in fact get a little bit of carry over to half crimp as well, just by kind of the shape that you make on these bricks. So I really quite enjoyed the pinch. Um, I think that it lends a lot of general strength to climbing and it supports the rest of this quite well. As far as which hold size to use, I think that most people are gonna see the best progress uh, or the best carryover to their climbing projects with the 10 mil. But if you're really fairly new to grip training, the 20 mil is not a bad idea. As far as which grip you wanna use as your principal grip, I'm a pretty big proponent of picking a hold type and then grabbing it however is sort of most natural. For most people on, a, on like a 10 mil here, it's gonna either be something like an open hand chisel or a strict half crimp. All those are fine. If they feel somewhat similar to you, I think there's a reasonable chance that a half crimp is going to be the most applicable. Um, so I would have a small bias towards cho choosing that. But if half crimps just feel weird to you and you feel way better in a chisel or an open hand, I think it's probably not a bad idea to do those as well. With a tension block in particular, there's sort of two ways that you can mount these. You can have the strap pulled through on one side, like so, <laughs> or you can have it sort of <clears throat> evenly pulled through both sides. There's a lot of merit to both of these approaches. Um, you're going to have a more, you're gonna have more of like a, a, a flat, like 90 degree pull <clears throat> with the straps equally pulled through both sides of the device. And you're gonna have a little bit of an effective in cut by pulling through just one side of the device. And this will flex back into neutral relatively as you kind of pull onto this. But um, I find that having it pulled through one side so that it forces this, uh, this effective in cut it's actually, it's very, very nice for crimping. It becomes a lot more ergonomic for a full crimp. But um, secondarily, it makes it even more uh, sort of immune to conditions. Um, as it sort of presses back into you, you don't need to worry about the hold kind of like bowing away as you pull on it or getting too slopey or just being like a little bit unstable. So though it is in some sense easier, pulling it through just one side tends to produce a little bit more consistent results in my experience. And so that's probably what I'd go for. Luckily, you can always just add more weight until it's adequately hard. So when you're doing these kind of lifts, typically you're far stronger in a deadlift or sort of squat position than your hands are gonna be able to accommodate. So you can get away with bad form. You're not likely to hurt yourself too much, but you'll get a lot of people both having a hard time pulling as hard as they can, and you're gonna start having some kind of like lower back pain. Sometimes you do a whole lot of these and you're kind of just like leaning into it like this. It's not the end of the world, but it's good to start early with good form. And the way that you're gonna to wanna to do this is basically walk your feet pretty much in line with your loading pin here. Make sure to set the grip with your other hand. A lot of times people will just kind of grab the block and you don't really have as good of a grip as it seems. So grab the whole thing, make sure that you set your grip really nicely. Everything's kind of sat and engaged well. Now you're gonna bend your knees, try to keep a straight back and tuck tips here. And you're gonna just stand up, pulling it like this. That's basically how you wanna do that. You don't wanna be bent over and kind of like arcing back to get it. You don't wanna be off to one side, kind of like pulling through the weight. You'll see a lot of times people get these up and they'll kind of like swing around and it's like, oh God, what happened here? Um, so as much as possible, keep it centered. 
Initiate, basically like sit, set, hips in and up. You want your shoulder to be set more or less at the center of your body, and you want to be kind of like resting your arm against your own like sort of chest and hips to sort of stabilize. As much as possible, you don't really want this to be like a row. This is not the exercise that you're going for. When you're doing block pulls, you have kind of one major form choice to make, and that's whether you want to do repetitions, lifting and setting the weight back down, which is sort of the method that's gained popularity here recently after the interview with Eves. This method is particularly um, useful, I think, for people doing grip sport because you're getting to practice the actual motion, which is getting the weight off the ground and locked out. Um, for climbers, it matters a little bit less. I think that it's a little bit a matter of uh, personal preference, whether you would like to do these as set repetitions or whether you want to do it as a static hold, simply counting up to the amount of time that you want to achieve. Both of these work really well. I think that they're pretty interchangeable um, and you can actually do both in a session if you'd like to. Um, I will typically do some static holds to sort of warm up. It lets me just kind of hang on to things longer and kind of fiddle around with how I'm engaging the fingers, where the pressure's at, things like that. Then I'll do the bulk of my workout with repetitions. Partially because this allows me to reset my hands and make sure that I have a nice grip every single time. And it's a little bit more condition independent. I might then finish my workout with a little bit of a drop back set where now that I'm a little bit tired at the, the sort of maximum weight, go down maybe 10 pounds or something and do one or two more holds at sort of like 10 to 20 seconds just to get a little bit of a pump going. I find that works pretty well, but you're able to kind of mix and match as you like. And I mostly will let people uh, choose a variation by their preference. I think probably for people just getting started with this, a simple hold is probably the most straightforward. There's just the least moving parts, but there is some merit to having to kind of like create this sort of more rapid sort of force development as you just kind of stand up and engage, as well as kind of controlling the place back down. So pros and cons for both, but they both work. Uh, there's not really like a magic bullet to one or the other. Getting a little bit into the nuts and bolts. If you've never done this before, you're probably not gonna have a great idea of what sort of weights you should be working with. That said, if you have fingerboarded or trained some sort of hand strength in the past, you might be able to make a pretty good starting guess. For example, if you know that you can do an assisted one-arm hang on the Beastmaker 20 mil, but you need to take off sort of 10 pounds, then you know that your max pull may be in the neighborhood of 10 pounds under, under your weight. Because these boards are suspended, they are not as stable as a fingerboard is going to be. And so even ignoring the differences in pulling, which you may be very comfortable and uh, confident and used to versus doing something like a deadlift that you maybe have less practice with, there's just going to be less strength application to sort of a mobile device like this than a fixed fingerboard. Um, there are a bunch of reasons for why that might be kind of beyond the scope of the video, it doesn't really matter. When you're still sort of uh, new to this exercise, I would expect probably in the neighborhood of 80 to 90% um, strength on the block as opposed to on the fingerboard. It will probably not be the same or more for most people. A kind of important circumstance where it might actually be more is if you do have significantly stronger fingers than your pull-up strength. Um, and in those cases, uh, this could be particularly effective for you as far as building stronger fingers. But equally, I would strongly recommend um, incorporating more pull-up work because you're maybe in for a bad time if your fingers get too much stronger than your shoulders and sort of musculature can handle. So um, sort of a useful diagnostic and a, a thing to compare against your fingerboarding. Okay, <laughs> so we now have taken a guess at our, our starting max. Let's call it 100 pounds, whatever. What you're gonna wanna do is start somewhere around half of that. So with your starting weight, you're gonna hop on here, give it a little bit of a feel, and give it something like eight reps. This, of course, is a guideline. You could do five, you could do 10. The point is to start getting just a little bit of comfort with the movement, um, a little bit of a warm up for the fingers, and a little bit of flow before you have to try particularly hard. Repetitions, very straightforward. One, two, three, four, however long. You get to your kind of eight, things are feeling good. Time to step up the weight. <clears throat> for initial testing, a good rule of thumb is if it feels absolutely staggeringly easy, slap on another 20 pounds. If it feels fairly easy, 10 pounds is generally a good increment. As it starts getting harder, you end up with smaller uh, step sizes until as you get to sort of your like three to five rep max range, you're gonna be incrementing along with probably uh, sort of two and a half plates. So we slap on another plate, try it again. This time we're going for sets of three. The reason that we're doing three here instead of five or more is 
for your initial attempt here, you're potentially going to be doing a lot of step iterations. Um, basically, you're going to be trying a lot of different weights until you find what's a good working weight for yourself. Um, and because of that, we don't really want you to get too tired doing full sets with each increment. So by the time I do three here, I can tell that this is still far too easy and I know to move on to the next weight. I don't really need to do five. You do still want to do enough that you're able to keep warming up and feel ready for the next step though. All right, so you're sort of two sets in. This still feels quite easy, but you realize that maybe it's feeling just a little bit harder. You're like, okay, cool. We're getting into the right range here. All right, you're a few sets in. Things are starting to get hard, but you know you have a little bit more in the tank. At this point, you're gonna to wanna to take a slightly longer rest. At the light weights, you can typically just take like 30 to 60 seconds, just kind of shake out, chalk up a little bit, make sure you're ready to go for the next one. But as the lifts start getting a little bit harder, you wanna make sure that you take an actual rest in between so you're feeling recovered and ready to go on the harder sets. Um, when you're well practiced, I find that these are actually quite a bit less fatiguing than fingerboarding. Um, and so you can get away with like a minute, but I would recommend more like three to five minutes if you wanna have like really maximal efforts. And then here you are. I think this is really pretty hard. You get through sort of two, three, and you find that you're having a hard time finishing the fourth one. Okay, so it might be a little heavy, but you find that this is around the right starting weight. I would say that for most people, something that you can do a solid three reps with will probably very quickly become your five rep max uh, as you start just getting familiar with this type of exercise. So you can afford to kind of err on the side of a little too intense at first. So that basically covers initial testing. You wanna have one or two sets of slightly higher volume to warm things up a little bit. You can also do it after a little bit of climbing, get your fingers kind of a little bit more ready to go with the exercise. And then in increments of sort of three to five repetitions, keep working up and up and up until you find your point of form failure. You don't necessarily need it to be complete failure, you don't need it to like actually blow out of your hands, but you realize instead of being able to maintain the grip that you've chosen and getting like good solid movement, you start really kind of like fighting it, things start to kind of bow open a little bit. That's probably around the place to stop. So how do we plan our subsequent workouts? A good method is typically to take the working weight that you found, slice it more or less in half. This can be influenced somewhat by available plate size. If your 50% max is 40 pounds, but you have 45 pound plates, that's fine. If it's 50 pounds and you have 45 pound plates, that's fine. <laughs> so with a little bit of practice, you'll find a little bit of flexibility there of what you wanna to do to start. I frequently will air a little bit on the lower side and have just like a nice chill set, kind of warm up the fingers and then do maybe another big set, kind of 10 pounds above that. So one or two very easy warm up sets. From there, you wanna think about what your working weight for the day is. So again, as an example, let's say your working weight is 100 pounds, your warm up weight is 50 pounds. I would want to more or less split that up with three additional like ramping sets. Um, this is gonna get you sort of free volume. Most of those should be hard enough that they do have a physiological adaptation associated with them. But more importantly, they're just going to let you kind of work up into that max weight rather than just trying to jump in the deep end when you're not really ready for it. Um, not only is that, of course, somewhat injury risky, but uh, you're just not gonna have the same sort of engagement and output that you would with a better warm up. So in our model where you have sort of 50 pound start, 100 pound target, I would probably do something like 65, 80, probably 90. So it can be an even split, but it's nice when you have the last set be fairly close to your working set. When you're first starting this type of thing, you can actually get away with just ramping to max and stopping. You don't really need very much volume to get a good benefit from it. Um, but over time, you're gonna find that you're able to do kind of a good number of these work sets. Um, three to five is good for a lot of people as an effective minimum dose. But because as I stated, um, you don't tend to get super, super tired from this kind of stuff. You can actually get away with as many as like 10 work sets. If I were to go that high personally, I'd probably do two different grips. But um, for a single grip, typically in the neighborhood of five sets is pretty good. And for those kind of three to eight repetitions, I'll work. I know it's a little bit vague. Uh, it depends sort of on what your goals are. If you're a rope climber or you're trying to do longer boulder problems or it's hot or you have a very mild finger tweak, anything that would encourage you to stay further away from like absolute max efforts, I would lean towards a higher rep range. Um, those are still gonna be extremely effective. Conversely, if you're trying to get ready for like a very fingery boulder project and you've been training for a long time and so you feel comfortable with, uh, with near max efforts, um, doing them as sort of sets of three can work very well as well. When you do these should pretty much always be prior to climbing. Anytime you're doing 
sort of maximal finger work, which for most climbers should be all of their finger work. Um, you want to do it when you're feeling very fresh. So whether it's hard fingerboarding or hard uh, block pulls or campusing, should all be done at the start of your workout right after warming up. Assuming that we're just doing this and we don't need to worry about any complications with other specific hand training, um, how often do we do it? Pretty much always two or three days a week. Three is probably best for most people if you have the time for it. Uh, fewer than two, you're not likely to see meaningful progress. Um, and more than three, it's kind of just getting into diminishing returns. You're not likely to see significantly greater progress with four days a week than three days a week. So for basically everyone, I would say if you can get away with it, three days, two is okay. I think that it works very well as a primary grip trainer, but personally, I do find fingerboard to still be a little more sport specific and probably what you want to bias towards as far as your sort of foundational uh, grip training. So given that, I think that a lot of times sort of a four to eight week stretch of, uh, of no hangs to complement and provide a little bit of variety is a good target to go for. Um, less than four weeks, you're just not going to have time to really see much progress. Honestly, you could do this pretty much as long as you're psyched and are continuing to make good progress. But um, I think something like two months tends to be a good block for kind of pivoting back and forth uh, as far as like exercise focuses. If you've done this a fair amount, so once you've kind of gone through your first cycle or two of doing the no hangs, um, it is not at all unreasonable to mix them with other types of training. Um, sometimes people will do a slightly shorter uh, no hang exercise and then follow it up with campusing so that they have just a fairly static type finger, uh, finger training followed up by a little bit more like timing and contact strength. Sometimes they'll alternate days between doing uh, a day of the no hangs and then the next day they'll do some fingerboarding and then no hangs again. So there's a whole bunch of ways that you can kind of mix it into your routine. Um, but as a rule of thumb, I would probably start simple when you're, when you're doing this the first time and just have the entire focus of your grip training be the no hangs. And then as you get more experience with it, you can have sort of more elaborate programming, mixing it in and out of your, uh, in and out of your training cycle and complementing it with other exercises. As far as how to progress it, there are two sort of immediate options and they can be actually melded together for a kind of like nice protocol. There are many more elaborate things you can do, but that starts getting very personalized and somewhat complicated. So uh, if you find that you need one of those, um, get a pen and pencil and maybe a book <laughs> or talk to a coach. Of the easy ways to do this, you can increase one of essentially three things. You can increase the weight, you can increase the number of sets that you do, you can increase the number of reps or the amount of time that you hold each set. So basically increase sets, increase reps, increase weight. Those are your choices. Very, very first, I would probably increase sets. So if you were to start with kind of ramping to a maximum weight, you would then ramp to a maximum weight and do sort of three sets of that, and then sort of ramp to a maximum weight and do sort of five sets of that. And that's gonna have a pretty good volume and it should be a pretty accommodatable way to improve initially as you're simply doing a little bit more of something that you're already able to do. From that point, it is generally pretty easy to start adding a small amount of weight. Most people will be able to add something like two, two and a half pounds a week for a good while. When you're adding weight, you can simply add weight to every single step along the way. And I think that works pretty well. So if I were to go with an example where I do something like 50, 65, 75, 85, 100, um, I would then just do 52 and a half, 67 and a half, 77 and a half, 87 and a half, 102 and a half. So a 2.5% increase week over week when you're new with an exercise should be probably manageable for kind of like four to six weeks. Um, it's totally fine if you increase weight sort of every other week, but if you find that you're not really able to add even a couple of pounds every other week, you probably want to go into something of a mixed protocol where you're kind of increasing reps and then adding weight and decreasing reps. And this is pretty easy to do as well. So it's pretty easy to think about just trying to increase sets, doing you know one more set than you had a previous session. Pretty quickly this gets out of hand though, so you don't want to be doing 10, 12, 15, 20 sets. Equally though, it's pretty easy to think about simply adding weight. We're not able to add two and a half pounds a week forever or ever you'd be getting at least 100 pounds stronger a year and that just isn't how this works. <laughs> so. Once you've eclipsed the sort of easy gains to be made by just increasing weight or reps or sets, um, you kind of have to start combining these variables to continue seeing regular progress, but even more so to have a clear plan for yourself as far as like, how am I going to keep making this harder in a way that's still tolerable? And this gets quickly elaborate. Uh, when you find yourself kind of getting into these waters, you may want to consider talking to a coach or working with somebody in person who's had uh, good experience with this sort of thing. But I'm gonna to try to 
explain one of the simplest complicated methods, <laughs> um, which I think of as last set matching. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're going to build up reps on each of these sets. And then once you get to a sort of set target rep on the upper end of the sort of classic strength range, you're going to then press those reps back down with uh, just a normal linear overload with weight until you're back into the sort of starting rep range. The way that you're gonna do this is you have some number of sets that you're completing for the day. Let's say that you're doing three sets of five repetitions and you've decided that you're going to try to increase your three sets up to 12 repetitions before you start working back down. The way that you're gonna do this is you do your first set, you hit five, great. You do your second set, you hit five, great. You're gonna take your third set to failure. So let's say that you get seven reps on the last set. Now that you've established that when you're a little bit tired, you can still do seven reps. Your next session, you're going to increase your first two sets to seven reps, or you're going to try to at least. So let's say you get seven on the first set, six on the second set, and then like four on the third set. Okay, that's fine, but you're not really ready to, to increase those yet. So you try again on the next session, seven, seven, six. You need one more. Now you're at seven, seven, eight. Okay, great. Next session, you increase the first one to eight and you just keep repeating this process, um, trying to increase the starting reps to match the, uh, the sort of like high point number of repetitions on the last set. Um, there's no need to back off. Like if you hit four on, uh, on your last set, you don't need to then go back to four on the starting sets. You're just trying to slowly work up until you can get all of your sets to the kind of target higher rep range. Once you've achieved that, now we have three sets at 12 repetitions. We start going in the other directions and you start adding some set amount of weight from week to week. Again, I think two and a half pounds is typically good. As you add weight week over week, once again, this is gonna simply repress your, uh, your maximum number of reps. So maybe you add two and a half pounds, you still get all 10 reps, cool. Next week you add another two and a half pounds, now you're down to eight reps, another two and a half pounds, down to six reps, and you just let it press you back down to sort of three to five range. By the time you've eclipsed the available relatively continuous progress from that approach, um, you've likely made a significant increase to your, uh, to your hand strength in these positions, and you can either repeat the cycle or better yet, probably transition back to something like fingerboard or campusing for a little bit. In some sense, the best way to do this is to have a really good feel of how your body adapts to training, really understanding how everything sort of works for you, and then making kind of on the fly decisions for the day. You know, some days maybe you'll come in and be like, oh, you know what, like, I feel very like strong and snappy today. I'd like to try working more in the three rep range. I'm gonna just try as hard as possible every set. And then you come back on another day and you're like, ah, I feel fine, but I'm not so snappy. I feel like maybe a little sluggish. I'm gonna do a little bit lighter weight and I'm gonna do a higher rep range. And as you kind of oscillate between these, um, you're gonna just sort of know yourself and know like which thing you're able to do more of on any given day, whether it's, you know, more sets, maybe less rest, more weight, whatever. And you can kind of craft something that is just always challenging for yourself and is kind of undulating upwards over time. And that's really what you want to be able to do. Um, but you're only really able to do that after years and years of training. And so having something that's a little bit simpler and a little bit more specific is quite helpful. As you may have noticed, today we are outside of the gym. <laughs> Figured we'd mix it up and enjoy some uh, unseasonably crisp weather as we transition into the scorching, miserable summer of Southern California. 